family, welcome to church. <laughs> Hello Covenant Grace. Hello Covenant Grace. From Don and Tracy and Jenny, Kate and Luke, we want to say a big shout out to everyone. We're missing you all and can't wait to see you all again, uh, hopefully sooner than later. But until then, take care, stay safe and enjoy the sermon. God bless. Hi CG, what an incredible church we've been called to be a part of. As we watch the service this morning, scattered but united in the Holy Spirit, I hope and pray that our bond is strengthened and that we can share it soon together in person. Enjoy the service and God bless. Morning CG Church and visitors. I'm Tracy and this is Jade and we'd like to welcome to our morning service. Hi CG Church, I'm Louis and this is Michelle. Hi guys, this is Papa and this is Knox. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how we're still able to do church life together, even though we are all scattered? Especially the live worship, it just makes it so much more meaningful. Uh, myself and Michelle have really been enjoying being back in the book of Exodus and looking forward to this next Sunday's installment. We miss you guys and hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye. So sit back as we tune into the next exciting episode of Exodus. <laughs> Well, good morning. Uh, it's great to have you with us today for our Sunday service. It is Father's Day, and it's a very special day for many families to be gathered together and to be celebrating uh, fathers and the important place of dads, fathers in the family, in the home, in the workplace. And so I want to talk a little bit about that uh, in a short while. There are a couple of other announcements which we just want to uh, bring to your attention. And the first one is that Daniel and Clarette got engaged this week. And so we want to send them uh, a, a great congratulations to them and uh, wish them everything of the best. And then also lockdown level three, we've had some uh, loosening of the restrictions, uh, in particular restaurants. And uh, I know that's good news for many of our folk who are in the hospitality industry. And that uh, brought to my mind a, a, a particular scenario, a um, of a restaurant that uh, got a bad review. The, the restaurant was on the moon. And the reason it got a bad review was not because the food was bad, but because it had no atmosphere. <sighs> well, it is Father's Day. And so my dad joke had to kind of get slotted in there somewhere. But uh, I want to read for the dads uh, from Ephesians chapter 3, uh, from verse 14. We read this, For this reason... I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being. We see in this text that every family derives its nature, its order, from the design of God. God is a father. God is creator. But the text tells us that he is a father. And so we have earthly fathers because we have a heavenly father. We have a creation because we have a creator. And so fathers know that you have a very important role to play in your home and in the workplace. And uh, part of the responsibility of fathers is to make Jesus known and to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want to pray for the dads uh, on this special Father's Day, and then we're going to worship together as a church. So let's pray. Father, we come before you as our creator, but also as our father. We thank you that from you and through you and to you are all things Thank you, Father, that you are sovereign and mighty, but you are also personal and with us. By the Holy Spirit, you are with us. And so we pray for our service today. Lord, won't you please bless our time together as a church, as we gathered now together as a community of faith. Lord, we pray for your blessing upon our service. Lord, we also want to, on this Father's Day, pray for our dads. We want to pray for the fathers in the home, that they would lead by example, that, Lord, you would empower them and help them to be good husbands and to be good fathers. Lord, we think of those homes, perhaps where there is no dad. We thank you that you, God, can be the father in that particular situation. You could father those kids. You could father that home. 
And so we thank you that we have a Father in heaven to whom we now come and we bring our worship and we bring our praise and we bring our lives and we bring our families and we bring our hearts and we bring ourselves to you and we bring an offering of praise, the fruit of our lips giving thanks. And so bless our dads and bless the service we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betray, the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid. Silence as he stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned, bowing to my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. Now my
Fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, He amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe. Doth seek to work us woe, his craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Whoa. And our striving would be losing Were not the right man on our side The man of God's own choosing You ask who that may be Christ Jesus, it is He, the Lord of hosts, His name, from age to age the same. And He must win the battle. to undo us We will not fear for God has willed His truth to triumph through us And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo We will sing your praise, 
gathered with us this day. We know that by your Spirit, you are drawing us closer. Lord, we know that you're at work in the nations. Although the nations are trembling and stuttering and falling and there's so much turmoil all around us, there's fear. Lord, you haven't given us a spirit of fear. You've given us your Holy Spirit who will guide us and lead us and comfort us. Still our hearts, Lord, we pray. We thank you for this time of worship, that although scattered, we could join together in song to worship you as your church. Lord, we thank you that you are with us. And as we Look at your word together this morning. We pray that you would speak to us, O oh Lord. As a church, as we journey through the book of Exodus, we pray that the Exodus story would become real for us. And that we too would have a, an Exodus out of Egypt, of sin, taking us out of the slavery of sin and into newness of life. So we ask for your word to produce much fruit as we hear it preached today. I just want to read from Romans 8, where Paul says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And we're going to see in the text today in Exodus about the Spirit of God leading people out of Egypt. But listen to this. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery, to fall back into fear. I, I think Paul has the Egyptians and the Israelites who were slaves in Egypt in mind, doesn't he? You didn't receive that spirit. You're, he says you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And so, Lord, we thank you that we are your children. We're no longer slaves to sin. In some ways, we are slaves to righteousness, sons and daughters of the Most High God. And as your children, we cry out, Abba, Father. Even on this Father's Day, we acknowledge you as the great and true Heavenly Father. And so we give you thanks. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So today we're going to be uh, reading from Exodus chapter 13, and I want to invite uh, Vili and Anita to come up, and they're going to do our reading for us today. Thank you. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery. For by a strong hand the Lord brought you out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. 
Today in the month of Abib, you are going out. And when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall not eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day, there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall not be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you, and no leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory. You shall tell your sons on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt, and it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this statue at its appointed time from year to year. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborns of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, or if you do not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons shall be redeemed. And when in time to come your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be as a mark on your hand or frontlets between your eyes, for by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, Lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea, and the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt, equipped for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For Joseph had made the son of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. And they moved on from Succoth and encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart, for, did not depart before the people. All right, thanks, Vili and Anita, for that reading. So chapter 13 really is about two main big ideas. The first one is covenant remembrance, and the other one is covenant renewal. Now, just to map out where we're going, each of those two main points are going to have three short subpoints. So let's jump into point number one, covenant remembrance. What we're talking about here now is looking back, and this is the very first moment that the Israelites are able to look back on their midnight exodus that they've just experienced. So let's read verse 3 again. Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand the Lord brought you out from this place. And then we read the same in verse 9, verse 14, and verse 16. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. Now in verse 3, it says, remember this day. And my first thought is, what? Remember that day. How on earth do you forget the Exodus? I mean, surely you're not going to easily forget, especially only hours after it. Moses is saying to the guys, listen, don't forget. Remember that day. Surely you're not going to forget the plagues. Remember the exodus, he says. The implication is this. The implication is we do forget. Humans easily forget. 
And so God gives to the Israelites during their journey into the wilderness, he gives them a calendar to shape their lives around certain feasts and festivals so that they won't forget. And these feasts and these festivals are kind of like alarms in your calendar that you set to remind you not to forget. But they repeatedly do forget. And if you want to read about how often they forgot, read it in Psalm 78. So what was the Passover and the Exodus all about? Well, really it was about coming out of Egypt. And that really gets emphasized in the text, like we read in verse 3, verse 9, verse 14, verse 16, about coming out, about being sovereignly brought out with the Lord's mighty hand. But what I want you to see is that it's not just about being drawn out, it's also about being drawn in. Look at this, God's goal is not only to take them out of slavery, but also to bring them into his presence. Look at verse 5. It says, when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites. And so we have this contrast of being brought out of Egypt, but God is now bringing them into the land of the Canaanites. In other words, on your way there, Together with the journey and when you get there, you are to celebrate these feasts and these festivals. You must keep them as a sign of remembrance. And, and they're going to need to remember the strong hand of the Lord because in Canaan there are enemies. And they're going to they're want to turn back and go back to Egypt. But you need to remember, Moses says, remember how the Lord brought you out for he will also take you in. The other thing I want us to note about the Passover, as they get to remember the Passover and on a yearly annual basis, they would celebrate the Passover feast. We must note that the Passover was a non-repeatable event. It was to be remembered, not reenacted. There was no way to reenact the Passover. What they were to do was to remember it. They were to commemorate the Passover and not reenact it. So what was the first thing they needed to remember? The text tells us in verse 2, it was about consecrating the firstborn. Verse 2, we read this, it says, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. So God says, hey guys, remember this. Remember that everything that's firstborn among you actually belongs to me in a very unique and in a very special way. And the reason for this is because the Hebrews, the firstborn, the only reason they survived the Passover plague was because a spotless lamb was sacrificed in their place. And so every firstborn to the family, it even included the animals, but now we're talking specifically to the children, Throughout their lifetime, they must remember that what happens to the lamb that they slay was what should have happened to me. And so it was a constant visual reminder. Remember this, that when the Passover happened in chapter 12, it tells us this. The text tells us that when God saw, it says, when he saw the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass over. The text doesn't say, when I see a Hebrew, when I see a Jew, then I will pass over. No, it says, when I see the blood. In other words, the judgment came to everyone in Egypt. And the only thing that made them differ was the blood of the lamb. Only those who had the blood of the lamb marking their house were safe. And so from this point forward in Israel's history, every firstborn was to be redeemed, was to be consecrated to the Lord by an act of redemption. They would have to slaughter a lamb in order for the firstborn to live. And so to remember this great act of substitution, every firstborn child was to be dedicated to the Lord. Now this progressed and developed in the nation of Israel in future generations, all the way through to where we see Jesus himself being taken to the temple and there as a baby being dedicated to the Lord. The point is this, every firstborn, whether 
animal or child belonged to the Lord. They owed their lives to him. That was the first feast that they were to remember. The second was the feast of unleavened bread. Verse 7 and 8 it says, Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you. Verse 8, you shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. This feast is explicitly given as a week-long, seven-day feast. And that what they must remember is that although they left Egypt very quickly, they should not move on quickly from celebrating what God did for them. He says, tell your kids all about it. For seven days straight, you are to eat unleavened bread. You are to remember that you were slaves. You are to remember that you were sinners. And now you are to be set apart. The leaven being represented of sin. No, you must take that out from among you. Now you must be dedicated, set apart, be holy as your God is holy. Be different to the people I'm taking you to. You must eat this bread as a constant reminder of where you came from and where you're going. You are to be different. The third thing that they were to mark as a sign of remembrance, point number C, is that they had to have marks or signs of loyalty. Verse 9, read this. It says, And it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. And then again in verse 16, the same thing. It shall be as a mark on your hand or frontlets between your eyes. For by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. Now, if you interpret this text literally, then you are going to end up like the Orthodox Jews who literally wear small little leather boxes of scripture, containing scripture on their hand and on their frontlets, their forehead. Uh, modern day, we call them phylacteries. And, uh, and, and Jesus actually addresses the Jews of his day. And in, in Matthew 23, he even rebukes the Jews for wrongly interpreting what this was meant to be. You see, they took the form of it without the heart of it. They applied the form and not the function. You see, because what Moses is saying here is that the word of God is to be so central to your lives. The word of the Lord is what brought you out. And so the word of the Lord is what's going to sustain you. It needs to direct your actions, meaning your hands, and it is to direct your thoughts. That's why it's to be written onto your forehead. And so it's not Literal, it's figurative. It's meant to symbolize the prioritizing of God's word over all of your life. And so those are the three things that they were to remember as memorials of being brought out of Egypt. Now, there are further things that get added later on as other laws get added. But that's what we find in chapter 13. The text then moves from looking back covenant remembrance to now looking forward, covenant renewal. There is no doubt in my mind that this would have been a massive injection of faith and hope in the Israelites in the promise of God. I mean, we have to, at this point, just slow down again in the text and realize what it would have been like for them. We must remember that God had promised that this would have happened. Over 400 years earlier, God appeared to Abraham. And when God came to Abraham, he told Abraham that this event would actually take place. That his offspring would be taken into a foreign land and that his offspring would be enslaved. And that after 400 years, they would then be miraculously Free. Now, that event has actually come to pass. And so the Exodus moment is a renewal of their faith. It is a renewal of their hope that actually what God has promised is really actually coming to pass. So what I want to do here is I want to go back to that moment with Abraham 
because I want you to see the promise. I want you to see the promise made over 400, almost closely to 500 years ago. And then we're going to come back to real time Exodus 13 and see how it's come to pass. So let's go to Genesis 15 from verse 7. And this is commonly known as the Abrahamic covenant, one of the most critical, important passages in all of Scripture. So here we go, verse 7. And he said to them, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur, the city of Ur, of the Chaldeans to give this land to you to possess. So again, we see here God bringing someone out of a pagan culture, a pagan land, and he's bringing them into a new land to possess it. And we know that the land is the land of Canaan. Verse 8, but he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And he said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. No doubt this is a sacrifice. There is a cutting of animals. God is entering into a covenant. Abraham's question was, how do I really know that you're going to do this? And then there's a covenant enactment. There is an oath that is being taken place. Look at verse 12. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abraham, let's just pause there. You need to note that as this covenant oath is taking place, where is Abraham? He's fast asleep. In other words, this is a unilateral covenant. In other words, it is a covenant that God is making with himself. It is a covenant of grace. Abraham is not a party necessarily in this particular covenant. It's not like Abraham saying, I'll do my part, you do your part. No, no, this is all God. Abraham is fast asleep. He's not involved in the oath taking place. Then the Lord said to Abraham, here's the oath, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners, pilgrims, in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, slaves, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. He's just rounding off the number. We know from Exodus it's 430 years. Verse 14, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. That's what we saw. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. This is a remarkable promise. Verse 15, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. Abraham's going to die. You shall be buried in good old age. And they, his offspring, shall come back here in the fourth generation. So over the, after the 400 years, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. The Amorites is an ethnic term for the Canaanites. What an incredible moment. A moment of promise and a prophecy of Abraham's offspring, which is exactly what we find has just happened in our Exodus journey together. Now, what I'm going to do is I want to return to this particular moment in Genesis 15 at the end of our sermon. So just bookmark that, right? I want you to note that we were there. So the question I want to ask now is, who is coming out of Egypt? Who is it that is coming out of Egypt? And from Genesis 15, it tells us that it's Abraham's offspring that's coming out of Egypt. Egypt after being enslaved and then there's going to be judgment and then God's going to bring them out. So who's coming out? Well, 
If we go to back to Exodus 12, just for a minute, from verse 36, I want you to see this. This is really important. It says there in verse 36, And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. So this is after the 10th plague. They've kind of just given up and said, now go. You can go. And before you go, just take a whole lot of possessions with you. So God gave them favor inside of the Egyptians. It says, so they let them leave with what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Verse 37. And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. Now, if you go back to Exodus chapter 1, we see there that they arrived and they were only 70. When they first arrived with Joseph in Egypt, Jacob's sons plus family were 70. We now see that just the men are over 600,000. Scholars estimate that it was close to 2 million Israelites that were leaving. Now, here's what I want you to see. Verse 38. A mixed multitude also went up with them, and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. Did you get that? Verse 38. A mixed multitude also went up with them. Who's this mixed multitude? Well, no doubt it's a reference to non-Hebrews. It's the non-Jews. It's the Egyptians. Now we know Pharaoh's heart was hardened and Pharaoh and his soldiers and men refused the judgments. But the text here is showing us that there were many foreigners, Egyptians, who did see the mighty hand of God and did change their, their minds about who Israel's God was. There's no doubt about it that they, they saw the mighty works of God and decided that Israel's God is the one true God. And so they go out with the Hebrews. It's not just Hebrews who are going out in the Exodus. It's Jews and Gentiles. Now get that. Please get that. Because it's critical to the Abrahamic covenant. It's Jews and Gentiles who begin and form the nation of Israel. And we know this to be true because just further on in Exodus 12, in verse 43 to 49... Moses is given instructions about how they are to be assimilated into the feasts and the festivals. Because initially it's a problem. It's a problem for them. How can non-Jews participate in a Jewish festival? And so we read about it. We read about it in verse 47 and verse 48. Have a look there. It says, All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. Now they're called a congregation. Notice that. There's a mixed congregation. The people of God. Verse 48, if a stranger, there it is, a foreigner, shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it, eat it, eat the Passover. He shall be as a native of the land, born of the land. You shall treat him as a full-fledged member of the community. This is incredible. This is the promise of Abraham already coming to pass. You see, we didn't have to wait necessarily until the incarnation of Christ. You see, the work of Christ is already at work. Just as the lamb who was slain is rescuing them, so a mixed multitude, a congregation of Jew and Gentile, at this point Egyptian, coming out in the great exodus. And so who's coming out? Well, there's a congregation who will be known as the people of Israel, but they're a mixed multitude. God has been at work, not only in Israel, but in Egypt. We must not forget that Moses' own wife, Zipporah, was from the land of Midian. And she too was a pagan Gentile until she became a part of the covenant community. Now, the next question I want us to ask is, where is God taking this mixed multitude? Where is he taking them? Well, look at verse 5 and verse 11. It says, When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, 
which he swore to your fathers to give you. Commonly, we speak about these guys as all the ites, and there's a whole lot of ites, but generally we know they all come from the land of Canaan. These were the sons of Ham. If we think back to Noah, he had three kids, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And it was Ham who was cursed. And he was cursed together with his sons, the Canaanites. And they went off to the land of Canaan and they lived there. And because they were cursed, God was going to give them over into the hands of the Israelites. So there is no doubt where they're going. They've been called out and they are going to the promised land, the land of Canaan. But notice that God's not taking them on the shortest route to get there. He's not taking the, the direct route. The direct route would have been to go north along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. But God takes them south. Look at this in verse 17. It says, God did not lead them by the way of the Philistines, although that was near. And so if they went north, they would have had to pass through the land of the Philistines which would have been the first enemy they encountered. And the text tells us that God didn't take them that way for, I think, two reasons. One is because they wouldn't have wanted to go straight into a battle and they would have turned back to go to Egypt. And secondly, because God is about to do something in them by taking them on the long route. And we discover in the text that the long route God is going to bring them, they're going to avoid war, but he's going to bring them to the Red Sea, which we're going to look at next week. But then I want you to notice this. When we talk about where's God taking them, we find this really strange verse, verse 19, where we read, it says, Then Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you. And you shall carry up my bones with you from here. Once again, what we see here, this is really fascinating. No doubt everyone's packing. Everyone's getting ready to leave because God visited at midnight and you need to be ready to go. And while everyone's rushing around getting ready to leave, Moses is busy digging up the mummified body of Joseph. They're going to take a mummy with them. That's what it says. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. Now you've got to think, well, why is that important? Well, this isn't just an act of sentimentality. This isn't just an emotional whim. Really, this is a physical reminder that God has kept his promise. Because just before Joseph died, 360 years ago, when Joseph died in Egypt, the text says that he made his sons promise him on his deathbed. He said to these boys, the, the sons of Jacob, he said, listen, guys, when the day comes and the day will come when God delivers us out of this land and he takes us to the land of Canaan, you take me with. Even if it's just a bag of bones, you take me with. Have a look at this in Genesis 50, verse 24. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die. But God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Verse 26, so Joseph died. Being 110 years old, they embalmed him and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. And right here in this moment, as they are journeying out towards the Red Sea, there they are, all the clans, all the families, and in the midst is the mummified body of Joseph. Joseph is experiencing the Exodus. What's the point? Well, the point is this. It is a visible, powerful reminder that God keeps his word. And along the journey, if ever you wanted to go back to Egypt, if ever you were doubting the faithfulness of God, they would just say, look at the coffin. Look at the box. God's word has come to pass. Joseph knew this day would come and it has come. And we are now taking him with us. We are taking him to the land of Canaan. They pull the coffin out of the grave and they carry it with them every day until they get 
to Canaan. Our third and final observation is how. How is God taking them there? Well, have a look at this. God not only visited the land of Egypt in the Passover, but he is now continuing to lead the people out. God's presence came to Egypt, but then God's presence remains with them. He remains with them like a pillar of cloud and of fire. In other words, through their wilderness journey, they are going to have God as their personal GPS. God is guiding them every step of the way. Look at verse 21. It says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way. Scholars tell us that it was really hot in that desert, in that wilderness, and they needed the shelter of the cloud. And it was a miraculous cloud, and it was guiding them, and they would follow the cloud by day. The text goes on, and by night, a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. The presence of God was manifest In a pillar or a cloud and fire. A cloud and fire. Now this theologically is known as a theophany. A theophany, theo meaning God and ophany meaning manifestation. A manifestation of God. You could describe it as a visible appearance of God's presence. It's the same thing that happened in chapter 3 with Moses at the burning bush. The bush was on fire, but it didn't burn because it was a manifestation of the presence of God. It was a visible sign of God's presence. God was going to be visibly both near to protect them and he was going to be near to guide them through the wilderness. And he was going to guide them perfectly along the way. Now, I want you to see something really crucial here. The same God, the same theophany who appeared to Abraham in Genesis 15 is now with Abraham's offspring. So let's just go back to Genesis 15 where we left off the Abrahamic covenant and we jump in at verse 17. The text says, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between those pieces. Remember the animals were split. Now God is passing between the pieces. 18, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, to your offspring, I give this land, the land of Canaan. God had sworn by an oath. He split the animals and then the cloud and the fire passed through the animals. This was a covenant ceremony. Abraham is asleep. God himself passes through the animals who had been split, the cloud and the fire. I hope you're seeing where this is going. Because the same cloud and the same fire, the very same presence of God, is now leading the people of God to the Red Sea. And right there, God will split the sea. Just as he split the animals and he passed through the animals, making a promise that he would bring them into the promised land. So here and now in Exodus 13 and 14, we see God splitting the Red Sea and the very cloud of God and the very fire of God leading the people of God towards the promised land. What a, what a fulfillment of, of prophecy. What a beautiful picture of God's abiding presence with his people. And so God is going to lead them through. And we're going to look at that next week. So don't miss it. It's going to be great. But finally, and really just to wrap this all up, what I want you to see is that this abiding presence, this manifestation of God with us, which we see regularly throughout the Old Testament, was foreshadowing, really, 
The great manifestation, the great manifestation of God in the incarnation of Jesus. All of these theophanies, all of these appearances are are little windows giving us insight into the reality that one day there's going to be a real manifestation of God himself. Where God, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, became flesh. The word became flesh. You see, this ultimately finds its fulfillment in the New Testament, in the incarnation of Jesus. But secondly, not only in the incarnation of Jesus, but also in the ascending of the Holy Spirit. Because remember in Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2, what do we find there? In Acts chapter 1, we see Jesus ascending to heaven, how? On a cloud. Jesus is taken up. On the cloud of God's presence. And the very next thing he does is he sends the spirit like fire. And so we see the ultimate fulfillment. The ultimate picture of redemption is that it was Jesus both in the cloud and the Holy Spirit in the fire. The the triune God marching his people. This is God's covenant story which ultimately finds its fulfillment in Christ. And so I want to encourage us as a church that God is faithful to keep his promises. And even when there is a delay, and even if the delay involves suffering and hardship, which no doubt it was for the Israelites in Egypt, God is faithful. And I hope that you are encouraged today to see the unfolding of God's everlasting plan and God's abiding presence. And I want to say to you, That even as God was leading them into the promised land, I want to say to us today that God is with us. God is with us by the Holy Spirit. That same fire is now for you as a Christian in you. God not only with us, but God in us by the Spirit. As we read in Romans 8, God has not given us a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. No, he's given us a spirit of adoption because we are his children. We are children of Abraham. If you have faith in Christ, you are a child of Abraham. Jesus is the ultimate offspring of Abraham. And so God is also leading us home. God is leading us to the ultimate promised land, the new creation of the new heavens and new earth. And he's going to guide us through this wilderness. And so let's pray together as we consider these great thoughts. Father, we we thank you for this amazing passage that is a great reminder of your steadfast love and faithfulness, of your covenant oath that you made first to Adam where you promised that from his offspring, from Eve's offspring, there would come a redeemer, one who would be mighty, one who would crush the head of the serpent. And then you renewed that covenant with Abraham, saying to Abraham too that his offspring, his seed would be mighty, and from his seed would come a king who we see in the New Testament is the son of David, the true and great king, the king of kings, Jesus Christ. And we thank you that you have poured out your Holy Spirit upon your church. And the same God that led the people of Israel is the same God who leads us today. We thank you, Father, that you are with us in the cloud and in the fire. By the Spirit, you lead us. Thank you that you've given us a spirit of adoption. You've adopted us. We are joined into the covenant people of God. Through the new covenant in Christ's blood, we are joined together with the family of God. And we're on the way. We are pilgrims through the wilderness of this world. We are journeying towards the new heavens and the new earth where, God, you would dwell with us. 
and all suffering and all sickness and all pain will be removed and all things will be made new. And so, Lord, we long for that day. Even in this moment, this moment of COVID-19, where there is sickness and death all around us, Lord, we long for the day when death is taken away, when sickness is removed. And so we thank you that you will be with us until that day. You will not leave us. You will guide us. You will protect us. You will never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing one last song together. So won't you join us? Maybe you want to stand where you are or, or just sit where you are. And let's just enter into and let's sing God's praises together. Amen.
Lord, you truly are holy beyond description. Lord, we gaze upon your word and we see glimpses of your glory. Lord, we look at creation and we see the majesty of your splendor. We look upon the Lord Jesus Christ and we stand in awe of your servant that you sent for our sakes. Lord, you are worthy of all of our praise and all of our devotion. And so on this day, Lord, we want to look back and we want to remember your faithfulness. But we also want to look forward and we want to renew our faith in you, the steadfast, covenant-keeping God, that you are true to your word. And you will bring us, your people, into our promised land. You will bring us to glory, into heaven. You will finish the work that you started. We thank you that together with Abraham, we are not looking back, but we are looking forward to that heavenly country where you dwell, where you live, where we will be with you forever in the new heavens and the new earth. We thank you. Your word says that the meek shall inherit the earth. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your promise. And we rest our entire hope on that promise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with us this Sunday. Have a great day. And uh, last word to the dads, uh, we celebrate you, we love you, and we honor you. Have a great day with your families. God bless. Hi guys, thank you for joining us today, and we really hope you've enjoyed today's sermon. For those that have been partnering with us during this lockdown, thank you, we really appreciate it. If you aren't and would like to partner with us to continue to make videos like this possible, you can find the details for giving below. You've been hearing a lot from us, but we'd also like to hear from you because after all, that's what being a body of Christ is all about. So if you would like, please don't be shy to give us a like, a comment and subscribe to our channel. And uh, if you'd like to give us a call during the week or even message us to say hi and just to talk about stuff, we'd be very open to that. But until then, have a blessed week and we'll see you next Sunday.